Your body is an amazing machine. It turns food into energy, heals wounds, supports your consciousness, and so much more. But it needs the right fuel to function at its best. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition with high-quality ingredients and less than three grams of sugar. This fall, you will want to try Organifi Gold. This delicious superfood tea helps you sleep and recover so you can wake up feeling refreshed and energized. It supports rest and relaxation, a healthy immune response, and a better response to stress. And don't forget about Organifi's other products, including their red juice, which is still my favorite, a delicious superfood punch that increases energy without the caffeine. You can reach for it in the afternoon instead of that sugary snack. You can experience Organifi's high-quality superfoods for less than $3 a day. Go to www.organifi.com backslash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off your order. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com backslash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off any item. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Allison, and I'm so glad you're here to discover what brings out the best of you. This podcast is all about breaking free from painful patterns, mending the past, and discovering our true selves in God. I can't wait to get started as we learn together how to become the best version of who we are with God's help. Hey everyone, welcome back to this week's episode of the Best of You podcast, where I am so excited to bring on my friend, Mary Morant. So many of you wrote in to me and told me how much you loved our first episode. It was episode 10, where we talked about limiting beliefs. And Mary had come out, Mary did come out of a really unusual set of circumstances. Essentially, her her first book, Dirt, chronicles her story of growing up with literal dirt, growing out of the ground of her trailer in West Virginia, and then finding her way out of some really limiting beliefs all the way to Yale Law School and into this life that she now has as an author, as a photographer, just doing all sorts of entrepreneurial creative things. And at the end of our conversation, it felt like we were just getting started because we really just kind of got through the first half. And it fits so well into this series, Mary, that we're doing on the ways that we begin to manage the perceptions of other people instead of really showing up as we really are. And it's so interesting because you say, you write, so you've got a new book that came out this spring called Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots, Finding Grace freedom and purpose in an overachieving world. And it makes so much sense coming out of your story because you describe your first book as a love letter to the girl in the trailer, this girl who broke out of all these beliefs and really achieved well beyond what you would have been taught to believe was possible or even taught to believe you should strive for. And again, go back to episode 10 and listen to that story. There's just some powerful words of wisdom in there about limiting beliefs, about the role of our parents in helping us kind of form those and just the nuance of breaking out of those beliefs. But then you describe this next book as a love letter to the most put together woman in the room. And you discuss this almost this second half. I you know, I'm I don't know if it's a second half or a, a third, but but essentially moving from those limiting beliefs into this achieving, perfecting for worth. Mm. And it makes so much sense because we bring all of who we are, you know, into and and maybe we gain a, a different level of success or maybe we get married or maybe we have whatever the thing is, you know, that you find yourself in this different place of life that you always dreamed of. And there you are. Well, guess what? Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. We're still there. So tell me a little bit about kind of this second phase or how would you describe this movement into this achievement or perfecting way of showing up in the world? Yeah. Oh, well, first of all, I'm so excited to be back. Like both of us, I feel like got to the end of the first conversation and we were like, but wait, there's so much exactly. more to talk about. And I just love you and I love spending time with you. So this is such a gift to get to come back and and get to talk to your audience because there's a lot more to the story. You're right. 
So there is something called the hero's journey. That is something that writers kind of rely on to make sure they have a good narrative arc, a good character development arc. And there is this part, it's usually like, depending on the description of the hero's journey, it's usually something like step three or four or five, but it's called the point of no return. Hmm. And it's when you have gone far enough out of your ordinary life, right? So it's sort of like status quo, inciting incident, something comes to shake up your world. You realize things have to change. You have to go out on this quest. You meet a guide who's going to help you. You start to face trials and then you go far enough that you've gone so far out into the world, it doesn't make sense for you to turn back. You have to complete the loop to get back home. And so I kind of feel like that was the journey for Dirt. Like I got to the end of Dirt and I thought I was done. I thought it was like a story about making peace with your past Mm -hmm. and going out into the world. Like the work God wanted to do in me and through these books was done. And ironically, Allison, there is an entry at the end of Dirt that I thought was like tying a bow on the story that actually becomes the inciting incident, the first entry in Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots, and it's called At Last Exhausted. Mm -hmm. And it says, at a certain point, you stop running. You have, you know, spent a lifetime proving this running, going so far out into the world, trying to prove your worth that you finally collapse and surrender this death to old life before new hope can take flight. But just like you were just saying about wherever you go, there you are. You realize no matter how hard I run, you can't outrun you. No matter how hard you run, you can't outrun you. And so that becomes what kicks off this second journey for me that I lived every single page, every single minute of writing this book, the work was being done in me of what it looks like to finally have tried so hard to achieve your way into worth, have tried it from every single different angle that you finally go, okay, maybe this is never going to work. Maybe there's no amount of more that can ever make me stop feeling less than. There is no amount of achieving or gold stars that are going to make me feel safe. And so you you finally have to reach that point in order to do this work. Because I think, you know, I've been comparing it to like entrepreneurs and burnout. I can tell entrepreneurs all day, every day, you're going too fast, you're going too hard, you need to build in rest, you're going to burn out. But until they start to actually experience burnout themselves, they're not going to believe me. Mm. So the the readers of this book and everybody listening right now, there's got to be this tinge of, oh, dang, you're right. Everything I'm surrounded by right now, I once prayed for, and it still doesn't feel like enough. If you're there, this conversation and this book are for you. This just popped out at me right away because you write at the beginning of this book, this book was birthed from a place of deep exhaustion and daily desperation, a feeling that a life spent chasing the next dopamine hit of a gold star high only to feel more empty with every check mark that seemed to numb but never satisfy. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was my life. Tell me about the moment when you began to real, you, you know, you're saying, To me, to our listeners, to everyone who reads this, you're saying you've got to hit that moment. And and again, it it may not be the rock bottom. We talk about rock bottom. It may not be the rock bottom of everything collapsed, failure. I was forced. I hear more in you. It's it's the rock bottom of this isn't getting me the actual joy that I want. Tell me about for you, what were some moments, if it was one or if it were a couple of moments when you began to realize this isn't this isn't working. Yeah. So I kind of like to compare it to eating an entire bag of marshmallows and then wondering why you're still hungry, right? So you have all these sugary sweet hits, you know, Mm -hmm. that give you just a little bit of a high, a little bit of that like energy boost. And then the, the satiation between marshmallows, that window of time of celebration, and that's enough and I can rest and I can pause and enjoy this. It gets shorter and shorter because you start to become ravenous. Like you're not being fed. You're not being nourished. So you just keep eating more and you feel sick. Mm -hmm. It's like fire hose of consumption. And you sort of just kind of just become like, there's this like sick and tired of being sick and tired moment Mm. of life. And so there's a part in dirt actually, where I talk about what if success is where the real trouble began and Mm. you reason we flip the channel when the underdog movie gets to the end, right? We don't we don't want to keep watching Rudy once he's gotten everything he wants. You know, we don't continue on with the story with the Goonies once they save their houses, whatever. Like we're ready to move on to the next unlikely story. Right. But what if for that hero getting everything they ever thought that they wanted becomes the moment they have to stand face to face in the mirror with their life because they got the thing 
and they still feel like a fraud, this walking, waking imposter. They still have to lay their head down at night in the cool cotton sheets and scream out at this thin epidermis, what are you possibly still screaming for? What is it that Mm -hmm. you want? Why do you still have such a thin skin? Why do you feel like a raw nerve ending walking around in the world? Mm -hmm. We have slathered on the marshmallow and you still, it's still not enough. Yeah. So for me, I think it was just reaching that point of, in slow growth, I say I have more stacks of sweaters than there could ever possibly be enough versions of me to wear, which I think will really get into our conversation today of like all the different personas we put on to fit in. And it's just like, it's just reaching that point of, I have all this stuff. I have all this stuff on my calendar. I have all these commitments. I have all these things that make me look busy and important and none of it makes me feel worthy. Mm. I think so much of what you're talking about is nuanced, right? And again, that's why, again, that hero's journey, that underdog story, you know, it's like, cheer, woo <laughs> And then comes the nuanced journey, mm. which again is why I love the title, Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots. It's it's not always that rock bottom story or that hero, you know, that, that underdog story. And yet it's the meat. And I think people are hungry for mm-hmm. it. Because again, like I said, it can come in so many different forms where you've got the marriage, you've got the kids. I've been watching, you brought up some great examples, but I've been re-watching the show Mad Men. Yeah. And that it's just, again, it's a dark show, but that depiction of the perfect mm-hmm. wife, the perfect life, the perfect kids, everything shined up on the outside and someone who is desperate mm-hmm. on the inside. It didn't cover over all of his, you know, that's essentially the gist of that show is all of his pain from his youth did not get fixed by creating this picture perfect life on the outside. Yeah. But there are lots of moments of cracks, right? Describe for me, you know, I don't know, after was it after Dirt came out? Was it after, you know, a big success? Would you just notice? How did you become aware mm-hmm. enough to recognize, I've got to stop chasing the marshmallows. You know, how do we begin to realize that? Because I don't know that people, I think people, when you're on the treadmill, yeah, you just keep running. You don't mm. know. And then if you do realize, maybe I need to get off the treadmill, what do I do? Mm-hmm. What is the solution? What is the alternative? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a really powerful moment in my life and I write about this in Dirt, and and I think it was already planting the seeds for slow growth. And so I've worked with a coach, a goals coach, for six or seven years at this point. And her name is Kim, and she comes up to Connecticut from Georgia once or twice a year, and we do goal setting for the next year or half a year. And we, she had her business is called the White Board Room, and she had just laid out this big white board on my white kitchen island, and my name was written really big in the center. And then she had written all around on that particular board, what we were focusing on, all the goals, all the dreams that had come true in the previous year. And so there were all these beautiful things surrounding my name. And she said, you know, she finished it. And she was like, look at everything you did. And I I burst into tears and I said, and I'm the unhappiest I've ever been. Mm. And she got kind of like sassy in her Kim way. And she like was using her arms to hold, you know, block all the things around everything except my name. And she said, all right, we've we got to work on this. This has got to change. We got to strip this down then. And let's hide all of these things that you've accomplished. Who is Mary? And she like slammed on my kitchen island. Who is Mary without all of these things? And I say in the book, I know what she was going for. I know what she was hoping for me. I'm supposed to say I'm a child of God, loved and secure. And instead in that moment, what I screamed was nothing. And we both kind of like stared at each other in this shock, slack jaw sort of way, wide eyed. And we realized, okay, this has to change. You know, and I think for somebody listening, if you're like, I... You know, I'm not an author. I haven't done this or that. Like, you know, I, I don't know. Like, maybe there are like these big dreams that I have in me that if I did do them, I would feel different. I would feel, you know, whole or complete. I think a good thing to pay attention to is that window of celebration. Has the time between when something good happens and when your brain goes, okay, what's next? Gotten shorter and shorter. And Allison, I am somebody who hosted an entire like 12 city. We had a giant tour bus with the name plastered on the side and our faces plastered on the side called the What's Next Tour with Justin and Mary. We literally went coast to coast telling people what's next, what's next, what's next. And so I don't, you know, talking about nuance, I don't want people to hear that you can't set and go after really big goals. I don't want people to hear 
that that thing in your heart you can't go a day without thinking about, you shouldn't go after it because a big part of slow growth is talking about Mm -hmm. the woman afraid to start. Mm -hmm. But what it is saying is if you can just release this idea that checking more boxes, getting more gold stars will suddenly make you walk into a room full of strangers and feel different. If you can just release that, if you can start to do that inside job work Mm -hmm. of liking yourself and loving yourself and spending time with God and saying, how do you feel about me? Because the world's never satisfied, that's for sure. I think then those other things will just hit different when they happen. They will be good, but they won't be everything. So much there. I want to pause on that. I love the moment. And you write about Kim at the end of Slow Growth. And I want to come back to her because what a powerful voice in your life. Mm -hmm. Just someone who really tells you the truth and someone with whom you can be honest. I think it's so interesting that in that moment, you knew the quote unquote right answer, right? A part of you is like, I'm a beloved child of God. But that's not what you were feeling in, in sort of in this parts model that I write about in Boundaries for Your Soul, a deep, tender part of you really believed without this, I am nothing, right? It wasn't all of you. You know the truth. You know you're a child of God. And I think that's just very real, Mary. I think Mm. many people, and we can almost shame ourselves. Well, I should know I'm a child of God, and so therefore I shouldn't care about these longings and desires or this longing to feel worthy or this longing to fit in or this longing to achieve a goal, whatever it is. And we can go one of two ways with that. We can either just, like you said, not start, because, you know, I should just be content mm. and not pursue anything because it's but really it's because it's too scary and vulnerable. Mm. But then there's the vulnerability of also getting some of the things you want and then realizing, oh, my gosh, this isn't making me happier. This isn't making me feel more connected. This isn't giving me that sense of belonging. And you write in the book. This is so good, Mary. You write. It takes a radical act of courage to see the miracle in the mundane. Mm -hmm. And then later you write, I've watched women like me who were running so hard from failure that they stumbled their way into what the world deemed success. And I think we could define success broadly. It could be that perfect family. It could be things you know, Instagram is telling us, you know, the perfect way of looking, the perfect way of being, the perfect job. There's a lot of ways, the perfect Christian, you know, ministry leader, you know, there's a million ways to define what that success is. Mm. And then you say, and I watched them lose it. Mm. What do you do when you've spent 20 years of your life acquiring what the world says matters only in the process to lose the thing you can never get back? Time. Yeah. Yeah. Oof, you're I, I'm in my 40s now. I turned 40 a couple years ago and I'm sure everybody is somewhat different, but the 40s from everybody I've talked to are just a really amazing unraveling time. And you just, you know, I think it's Brené Brown who has a great quote about this or Liz Gilbert, one of the two. And this is the time of your life when it sort of the world, you know, the universe takes you by the shoulders and shakes you and says, "What are you waiting for?" Like We got to get out there and do the thing we were created to do. And this great unraveling, this great softening, I think to me is I picture like a white knuckled clenched fist. You've reached a point of doing that for so long that the muscles just give way. And they're like, honestly, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And the palms open. And I think it's a metaphor for what happens in your whole life where you just, one of the great gifts of aging is you just don't have the energy to white knuckle it the way you have before to perfect and perform and be all the people, all the things to all the people. And so, you know, you also, life just happens to you. And I, you know, I talk about in the book, I have friends, we all started together in college. All of us had similar like hard stories and we were just out to like, you know, be these girl on fire, change our entire family tree. And in so many ways we have to be clear. In so many ways, our families are now healthier, but we equated changing our family tree with outward success. And then you see marriages ending or Mm -hmm. houses. One of my favorite lines that that came to me for slow growth that I feel like was a gift from God was talking about houses built right side up and then sold upside down in the ultimate of bubbles bursting, Mm. which is just like such a fun line and also horrible because, you know, you live through a financial crisis, you live through a pandemic, you live through 9-11, whatever, you live through personal crises like that. And it just really starts to put in perspective. I have a finite amount of energy and I have a finite amount of time. 
and I've witnessed how much time was wasted worrying about all this stuff that did not ultimately matter. And it's time to get serious about what does. And even that line, I want to say this before I forget, that line, the woman, the most put together woman in the room, that is in the manuscript and that is what I wrote. But by the time we got to marketing the book, we knew we had to make a really quick pivot because ironically, this book is for the woman who is so relentlessly hard on herself that she would never call herself the most put together woman in the room. And that was the always the point. Of course you don't, but you work so hard to belong to not even have a hair out of place and everybody else, you stumble into this place where everybody else sees you that way yep. in this perfection to belong. Where you try to be perfect to belong ironically becomes a stiff arm, a Heisman that keeps everybody else at arm's length from us. So it's, I mean, I got so many, I got so many opinions about all of this. That's so good. I love what you're saying that we've done so well at chasing our own tail, really, because really mm-hmm. it's about us. It's not about other people. I mean, the thing about managing perceptions at the end of the day is it's really trying to fill something inside of us, but we can do it so well that they believe the story we are telling. Yeah. And that is a lonely place to be, to realize mm-hmm. I've created this perfect image of myself to try to avoid pain, to try to avoid shame, to try to belong so much so that other people believe it and don't come to my aid, don't know how to help me, don't know how to find me. And I think that's just so powerful. It reminds me what you're saying about the 40s of Carl Jung talks about the afternoon of life. Mm. The morning of life is where we're kind of trying to get all the things. And then we pivot toward the afternoon of life. And Eric Erickson also talks about we move into purpose and meaning, into generativity. And so tell me a little bit about, so how do we, you know, I mean, there's an extreme form, right? There's that extreme form of what you're saying where you've created this perfect illusion and the bubble pops and well, you have no choice, you know, because Mm -hmm. the bubble has popped and everybody sees that you're more vulnerable then. And so you find out very quickly, you know, who really were your real friends. There's that route. But then Mm -hmm. there's this sort of more subtle, again, more nuanced route of just growing in awareness, which is your story, growing in awareness of, I've got the cart before the horse. I remember telling my husband this summer at one point, I said, "I, I can just tell inside of me that the horse and the cart are dead even. Mm. And what I mean by that metaphor, right, is like the trying to perform and produce and make sure everybody else is seeing me a certain way. It's dead even with the real marrow, the real call to obedience. And you talk about that. Mm -hmm. You talk about that shift to really it's about what is God asking me to do? When you get into that place, when you get into that place of going, I'm aware that I'm perfecting and achieving, whatever the thing is, perfecting, achieving, I'm creating this thing. We're going into the holidays, you know, down to like just how I'm approaching Thanksgiving decor, you know, or how I'm approaching my kids or how I'm approaching, you know, I've got to get it right. That that Mm -hmm. white knuckling you talk about, right? Yeah. We might even feel aware of that. And I just want everyone to hear that awareness is the very first step of just what if I could... But then let's talk, let's shift into talking about, again, what is that alternative? Because as you so aptly stated, we're afraid to let go because we don't want to feel, but the alternative is nothingness. Mm -hmm. The alternative is everybody will hate me. The alternative is I'll be shamed. The alternative is whatever the narrative. So for the woman who's feeling that, but what am I supposed to do? If I don't do it perfectly, what do I have? Tell us a little bit about what do we have? What is the alternative Root. And, you, and you, I've got a quote here, but I want to just kind of hear it in your own words a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing that I'll say is a really cool parallel that I was really excited about between these two books, because I do very much consider Dirt and Slow Growth to be these bookends, like a two-part volume that very much go together. It's the rest of the story, as it were. So in Dirt, I talk about the girl in the red cape escaping her way out of the deep dark woods, this big bad wolf ripping at her heels, branches clawing and tearing at her clothes, leaving these breadcrumbs behind of this place called home. She looks back over her shoulder, breathless and wild eyed. And finally at once I see it. I am the girl in the red cape, but I'm also the wolf. And that voice in my head telling me to run and not stop running, that it will never be safe to stop. That if you stop, you will just, the boulder will roll back down the hill. You'll be back in the trailer or whatever. That voice is my own. And so in Slow Growth, we revisit that 
seen this time from the perspective of the wolf. And it's talking about how at a certain point, the big bad wolf is now afraid of us because it's saying that essentially we learned to twist the thorn in the paw of the wolf who is wounded because if we don't want to stop running, then it can't stop chasing us. So we have to know how to, you know, the right pressure points, the right wounds to dig our thumbs into to send it roaring back into fight or flight mode so that we can keep running. And I just want to read this part right here where it's talking about what you were saying, this idea of it. What, what do I do if I stop? you know, and I just disappear altogether. And I say, we used that adrenaline. We became addicted to it. We feared we would forget how to move forward altogether if we didn't have something constantly clawing at our heels. The greatest fear for those of us who are trying to break free from all this achieving for our worth is this right here. What if I do the work to get healed and in doing so, I lose all my drive? What if I lose my edge? What if I suddenly have to be content being ordinary? Average, what if I stop winning, stop being the girl who always comes through, and in doing so, I just disappear altogether. So we go from being the one being chased to the one twisting the thorns. Mm. And so when I think about, okay, I, you know, we're on board, Mary. Let's give up achieving for our worth. Let's move out of this place of eating the marshmallows and like being like these, you know, dopamine, sugary, sweet mm. highs. There's a part in Dirt where I talk about treating God like a Pez dispenser. You just keep the sugary, sweet, you know, hits coming, God. I don't care that my faith is anemic and I'm actually starving. Mm. So the way for me, besides that exercise, who is Mary without all of this? When we peel back the layers, if you had to introduce yourself into a room without naming a single achievement, accomplishment, resume, accolade, who would you be? Would it be enough? Would it be enough to just have a witty sense of humor and an old soul, right? Who who would you be if you couldn't offer connections or influence or audience or the right introductions or your help or your service, right? If you wouldn't say yes all the time, who would you be? What's mm-hmm. left? That's the first step. And then the second step for me that's been really huge, especially when we think about that journey of this girl in the red cape running from survival. And we think about the spectrum. I don't know. Maybe you know who created this. There's this spectrum of survival to stability to success to significance. And I actually did a reel talking about our episode where I was talking about this concept of capacity. And if we only have a shot glass worth of capacity of what we think we are capable of handling, what we think we can be trusted with, then anytime our lives get more, we will unintentionally self-sabotage and start back over at the beginning. And we have to learn to expand the capacity of what we think we can be trusted with. And I talked about our episode of you saying the way that we do that is to set these little commitments Mm -hmm. with ourselves and keep them and show ourselves there is an adult who can be trusted. That adult is us. And that as we keep those small commitments, that capacity for trust of ourselves expands. And so one of the things that I learned is that I got stuck in a very clear loop of survival to stability to success, unintentionally self-sabotaging and being back into survival because it felt familiar. Mm-hmm. And here's here's my big like mic drop moment of like what God has really been teaching me lately is that in that spectrum, there is survival to stability to success are connected. And then there's this big, you know, it was finished on the map, but it's not really their gap where bridge should be from success to significance and that leap we have to make over to the other side is the first three we focus on self but we don't get to significance until we're ready to focus outward to others to who it might serve and until we make that change we stay in that loop we get to the top of the hill we can't make that leap and we roll back down to the beginning Mm -hmm. and that's what I experienced for years Mm -hmm. got to the tippy tippy top of success self-sabotage and back to the beginning Yeah, it's so good because at the end of the day, and this is so painful. I remember the first time for me, it's, it's more in the category of pleasing. There's subtle distinctions, you know, we're kind of loosely talking about the seven P's, but, but they're all loosely related. It might be, whether it's perfecting or achieving for me, it was pleasing. And I will never forget the first moment. This is kind of getting at what you're saying when someone said, oh, honey, that part of you isn't working for other people. That part of you is working for you. I was like, no, it's not. That part of me wants to make other people happy. Right. She was like, "Mm, yeah, but mostly so that you feel good. Yes. Right. And that's kind of what you're saying, I think, with the achieving and the perfecting. When you're on that cycle, when it's really ultimately about 
I've got to prove myself it is going back. And again, no shame, right? This is These are parts of us that have learned these jobs well. This is how we learn to survive. We talk a lot about on, there's no shame in any of this, but self-awareness can be hard It can to realize, I think what you're saying, Mary, tell me if I'm right, but you're saying at the end of the day, what got you off that treadmill was beginning to ask your question, how do I actually want to serve? Mm-hmm. How yeah. do I want to connect this in to connect? And again, that gets to connecting to others. I'm not trying to prove mm-hmm. anymore. I want to connect what God's done in me to another human. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for me, I think about that idea of why deep breathing moves you out of fight or flight and into tell me the proper terms. I feel like your audience is going to value the proper terms. What What is it? You move into the limbic brain? I would say we move back into, there's a couple of words we talk about, that sort of spirit-led self, that place inside where we're calm, curious, compassionate, engaged. The other word would be the window of tolerance, where we're mm. out of fight, flight, and more operating out of that sort of calm, creative space where we're connected to ourselves and connected to other people. This is the place of authentic connection, right? Because we are connected to the best of who we are. You have gifts, talents to bring to the world. But we're not, as you said, adrenalized, trying to prove ourselves or shutting down, trying to hide. We're in that beautiful place where I think the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, the spirit led self, the window of tolerance, where from that place, we take the best of who we are and engage Mm -hmm. the other people around us. And it becomes relational. Yeah. Well, so the idea of like the taking the deep breaths, shifting you out of fight or flight is that if you were actually being chased by a woolly mammoth, you wouldn't have time to breathe like that, right? Like you can, so if if your body's like, oh, we're taking deep breaths, everything must be fine. I find a lot of parallels in this spectrum of achieving and everybody listen to me when I say this part, because this could be the light bulb moment for somebody out there is in dirt. I said, listen, it really started to bother me that people started to hear a story like trailer to Yale Law and go, okay, so the only side effect of this like air quotes hard part of your story was all of this success. Like they started to act like success was the only side effect. And what I wanted people to know is how primal, visceral, survival achieving becomes for those of us who have had that switch flipped, this mirror shattered, these broken shards we're trying to put back together. We do not know how to breathe if it goes too long without a win. And so when we are in that loop of survival to stability to success, they all kind of feel like survival to us. We are self-preserving. We are trying to get the little girl to safety. And so when we start to become focused outward on others, when our brains, that lizard brain is not screaming out for another win because you, you know you, your whole life is going to fall apart if you go another day without a win, what it allows us to do is to go, we can tell we're in safety because there's room for generosity, right? We're serving other people. We're going, one of my favorite lines in Slow Growth says, the use of my gifts in service to others for your ultimate glory for the rest of my life. That's it. But that inner core part of me that knows that and relaxes into that is surrounded by this outer part of me that has access to the world that is like one big raw nerve ending screaming out for more. And it says that version of me is insatiable. So the more I lean into significance, which I think is defined as service to others, the use of your gifts and service to others, the more I go, we're safe. Look at us. Mm. We're safe. We're in a place where we can actually pour out. Mm. And it just, it makes my brain stop feeling like it's on fire for a while. Wow. And so when you sink into that deep breath of safety, you feel, therefore, then the contentment, the satisfaction, the hat, quote unquote, happiness that you actually thought was in the achievement, but is actually in. It's not in just checking out of the game. It's right. it's using all that God has given you in a way from a place of safety and a place mm-hmm. of generosity to others. Yeah, because on some level, you like your brain, it's kind of like your brain going, hey, we're breathing deep, therefore we must be mm-hmm. safe. It's like, hey, we're, we're being generous. We're serving out. We're pouring out to other people. We must be safe, right? And I think that can be like a, an interesting loop where it's like, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? It's like, are you generous? And then you feel like you feel contentment or do you need the contentment in order to be generous? And I feel like for me, they just... 
they feed each other. It's like a flywheel. That's beautiful. It reminds me, for those of you listening who've read Boundaries for Your Soul, the parts language for what you're saying, what it reminds me of is it's like the the young, tender part of you, the little Red Riding Hood part of you that really was scared and unsafe and needing protection. The more she actually feels safe, the more you breathe in and and she's cared for inside yeah. of you, the more you're no longer, you, you, you kind of bust out of that the more of you comes online, your protectors relax, the sort of achievement protectors kind of relax. Oh, wait a minute. There's nothing to prove here. We're safe. We got ourselves yeah. out of the forest. Yeah. So the protectors relax, you know, and then all of a sudden you have more of yourself, more. It's it's not that you have less. And that's the thing. We The protectors feel like the achievement part feels like, oh, we'll be nothing without this. Mm -hmm. But instead, when you're safe on the inside, when every part of you, those tender, young, vulnerable parts of you that have been through a lot become safe, become cared for, what happens is those protectors, again, I'll say it again, the the perfecting, achieving, these are all protectors. These are all ways that we're trying to protect ourselves by managing perceptions and keeping us in belonging, keeping us, you know, they actually soften, but they don't stop. They actually do their job better in a more harmonious, more (laughs) generous, more, if you think of the fruit of the spirit, truly loving, kind, gentle way, both with yourself and with others. Yeah, I love that. It reminds me of when people talk about the Enneagram and they're talking about the achiever, like the healthiest achievers are the ones who are in a place of going out to help others achieve their goals. I love that so much. That's so good. And I, I mean, before we go any further and I forget to say it, I have to tell you, that that part, I mean the whole book, but that part in particular in our conversation of the best of you about reparenting yourself and building trust in these little commitments is changing my life. I think about it pretty much every single day of my life, Mm. pretty much. And I think any person who grew up with that chaos or a little bit of instability and you feel like an adult with all this internal chaos, go get this book and read that part in particular. Thank you. That's that that means a lot to me. But it it because it, it does dovetail into everything you're saying. If that little young girl, she's still there. She you're doing that for her, really. Mm. You're showing her, no, no, no. She doesn't go out in that room and perform. She needs you to care for her. And then the whole system, as you said, the whole nervous system sort of softens, yeah. relaxes, and then you're actually more, <laughs> you know, that's the paradox. You can show up more effectively. Yeah. For other people. I love how you talk about the raw nerve endings, you know, that primal scream Mm -hmm. of please is coming from a young one inside who didn't get the care that she needed. Yeah. And I feel like everybody listening, we should just sit here for a second and we should go, when you're in a room with, with a bunch of people, who are you drawn to the most? Is it the one who is willing to be vulnerable, is willing to own who they are, is willing to be like, yeah, I love this thing, whatever. I don't care if it's cool or not. Or is it that untouchable? Is it that woman who does feel like the most put together woman in the room that you feel like you could never connect with or relate to or be enough of something to sit with? Well, ironically, most of those most put together women in the room, I mean, I've been that woman where people assumed because I didn't grow up with a lot of nice clothes, so I really love clothes now because of how I was dressed, that I must be standoffish. I must be, you know, the Regina George <laughs> in the room or whatever. And ironically, I was just doing that to hopefully not get kicked out of the room myself. But you wind up with a different form of isolation and alienation. That's right. With so much going on in the world and in our lives, it's common to feel anxiety and stress. And when you're dealing with anxiety, you're at a higher risk of suffering from trouble sleeping. That's why I'm so happy to tell you about the Abide, Sleep, and Pray meditation app. It's the number one Christian meditation app that's been proven to reduce stress, improve your sleep, and deepen your experience with the peace of Christ through biblical meditation. I tried Abide after having trouble falling asleep, and it made it so much easier to get to sleep. It calmed my whole system down. It's such an immersive experience, and it makes it easy to practice regularly. With Abide's premium subscription services, you get ad-free meditation, plus you get early access to more content, background music customization, a sleep timer, and even a journal to record your progress. 
Sleep better and find peace. Download the Abide app today and boost your mental, physical, and spiritual health. Right now, I have a special offer when you subscribe. 25% off your first year when you sign up for the premium subscription. But only if you text my promo code BEST OF YOU to 22433. Don't wait. Download Abide, Sleep, and Pray Meditation today and text my promo code BEST OF YOU to 22433 today to get 25% off. How do we move toward authentic connection? I love what you're saying about it's it's first and foremost checking your own motives. And you talk about that in the book. Before I do anything, checking my own motives. Mm-hmm. You know, am I doing this to try to win a gold star? Or am I doing this? Is the is the young one inside of me well cared for? So I'm doing this because I think it it'd be bring me joy and or I think God is calling me to it. I think mm-hmm. it's, you know, so there's that piece. And then there, I love what you just said. There's also this other piece of healthy vulnerability of mm-hmm. knowing when to be in the room as yourself and, and saying, you know, giving an honest response yeah. to somebody about how things are going. Yeah. And I, I honestly do think for, at least for me, that is something that has gotten easier with age simply because of that thing we talked about earlier, like the the ability to hold it all together all the time and and think about what the perfect response would be. I just don't have that kind of energy anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you just sort of let it fly. And And there's this really interesting, this is such a side note, but it's kind of interesting where you mentioned my husband and I are entrepreneurs. We have a bunch of different businesses. We have photography education and so on. But one of the things we've been doing for the last like year and a half is a Poshmark business. And I think there was a version of me earlier in in our career where I wouldn't have wanted to talk about that because it's not like... I mean, it's it's a ton of fun and it's actually become a huge business for us, but it's not this like glamorous, cool, you know, like we're literally going through Goodwill and my pearls and my Yale hat going through the Goodwill bins, you know, I just reached this point where I was like, you know what? I don't care. And I don't feel like hiding this anymore. And I'm just going to start talking about it. And everybody loved it. Yeah. I got so many responses to that. And I just think that's a really good example of you know, you become this, you'd come off the pedestal, you come off the like untouchable, like being an author, whatever. And you're like, oh, like you are just doing this fun side hustle too. I don't know. It's a weird example and probably story to share, but I feel like more people have reached back out to us that I hadn't heard from in years talking about that than talking about any amount about the books. People read authenticity. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And so you, you know, I could see your whole face light up talking about it. Like, you you know, you're like, this is just so much fun. It really is. It's like a treasure hunt. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I just I found that a little bit in my own life, in my own journey of making sure, again, the the horse is leading the cart, meaning the horse being what do I really want? What does God really want? What how am I really connecting to other people versus my own desire to manage perceptions and whatever way, you know, that's going to, that's really about, and again, no shame, but it's really about feeding some part of me that doesn't need the cotton candy, that doesn't need the marshmallows, that actually need, you know, that's my cue. Oh, some part of me needs real nourishment, needs me to show up for her, right? Because she's never going to get fed by all this. So once I, you know, it's always my cue. It's like, okay, I've got to do the work, get her what she needs. And then getting down to business of, am I doing this because I love it and God put it on my heart? It is such a paradox. Mm. You will find the people and that that's what I hear in your example. It's like all of a sudden people show up when you're real, but would you want to be in relationship with the people that aren't delighted, right? you know, and tickled by the things that delight you? <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that's such a great litmus test. Like anybody who needs me to whittle off parts of me that are very natural, very authentic, very much make me light up, that's never going to be successful. It might work for a short time, but that relationship's never going to go the long haul. And I, I think about bringing it back to being an author, for example, and there was for like a little while, like a conversation of like, can you talk about business and also you know, be an author and can you like have these other, you know, ventures going on? Like, should we take business out of the podcast? And it was like, you know what, all of us as a team were like, actually anything that shaves off parts that make the, you know, Mary, Mary, that's never going to be a winning strategy. And like Mm -hmm. your people want all of you, your people are like craving for all of you to show up. And 
I think like social media, for example, it's become all about, you have to niche down, you have to niche down. Your message has to be really specific. People have to know what they're going to get from you. If you want to go viral, if you want to become the expert in that thing, it's got to be the same thing. Bam, 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 bam. And it's like, it might work as a strategy, but meanwhile, you stop feeling like a human that has all these interests besides that one thing. So yeah, that's my strategy moving forward. Anything that requires me to carve out, whittle out pieces of me in order to belong, it's not for me anyway. Yeah, I we could talk about social media all day long because I just think it is just this. Yeah, I've noticed it in myself. I'm like the first thing I got to do if I'm start is just stop paying attention there because yeah. it is like you said some of those strategies work and you lose your soul. You know, yeah. <laughs> or you know at least you lose that you that like it. Yeah. that joy and that that authenticity. Just to close, I want to just touch on this idea of comparison again, because mm-hmm. the social media definitely brings that up. But even just in our day to day lives, I mean, I tell I, I've talked about it on the podcast and you know, I don't think it matters to anybody else. But I, I talk, tell about the moment I made peace with the fact that, oh, I'm not a home decorator. <laughs> like, it's just, like you come into my home and it's really warm and it's like a patchwork quilt. I love that. I'm good with that. I, but mm-hmm. I had I didn't. That was a way I was like, I would be doing this to please other, you know, so that I could not, you know, I don't know, be shamed or whatever, feel like I fit in. And all of a sudden it just occurred to me, I don't enjoy the process. I'm not good at it. I would rather spend my time on other things. And I started to own it and be Mm. like, oh, I just, what you have when you come into my house, it's it's a beautiful patchwork quilt of a lot of really interesting aspects of my life. There are a lot of, and, and that brings me joy And the minute I had peace with that, then other people, again, to your example, are like, oh, this is so cool. But prior to that, I was like apologizing. I was like killing myself to try to get the house right so that I could have. And I was like, this is just not working for me. It's Mm -hmm. not a gift that I have. And simultaneously, what that does is it frees me to delight I, I'm the biggest fan girl of, you know, like right now I can see your bookshelves behind you and I'm like, they're so pretty. And Mm -hmm. I genuine, like that's, it's, it's become a very genuine, like, oh my gosh, like I love to go and like, look at how, uh, because you celebrate other people when you've made peace with yourself. It's like, I'm no longer comparing because I'm good with myself, you know, I'm good with myself on this category. And Mm -hmm. so therefore then I can enjoy it when I see other people really delighting in Mm. what they're good at. And so I was just curious because you do, so there's a couple of ways I think that can play out, but you do talk about, you say comparison robs you of the permission to enjoy your own life. Yeah. And I just thought that was just a, you know, in that one chapter, there was a lot, but that one kind of stood out to me because it's something I've struggled with. And I think it's so true. And there's something about when we're when we're comparing, we're managing perceptions. Mm-hmm. We're we're trying to be all the, all the things in a way that isn't true. Whereas when we just enjoy, like what you just said, I enjoy this new thing. I'm enjoying my own life. And maybe that means there's a few things that I'm not going to go after, even though other people might think I should. Mm-hmm. There's freedom in that. There's freedom to enjoy your own life, but there's also freedom to enjoy other people's yeah. choices. Yeah, a hundred percent. First of all, before I even forget it, I think talking about social media, there's a really interesting sea change happening there. And I think it kind of originated on TikTok, but I do think it's starting to spill over in Instagram, where Instagram used to be the land of like influencers and perfect everything. I think what's really resonating now, especially with the younger generation, like the Gen Z folks in particular, is that like you know, own your quirky, weird, own your authenticity. Like it's the sort of like Elise Myers, like, let me just show up with my hair in every direction and tell you something quirky on my heart. People are loving that. So that actually gives me a lot of hope because what we know, and it can be, it's been said 15 million times and it'll be now be 15 and one million and one is that none of that that we have seen for years on social media is real, right? Yeah. Like it was taken from the perfect angle. It was, you know, cropped. Like there's that whole fake famous documentary. I haven't watched it, but I know what it's about that they're faking being influencers basically. And they they show the behind the scenes of how the photo was actually taken to see if they can get it to work. And it's just like, none of this is real. And like spending your day going, you know, talking about we can't get that time back and the clock is ticking and, and the things we think matter won't be the things yeah. that we miss. We have to say, what does the majority of my real life look like? Yeah. Am I getting anchored with my people? Am I getting anchored in yes. my home? 
And then the other thing I will say about comparison and, and competing and trying to perform and be perfect is there's this really ironic thing that happens that we've experienced with our home. So little backstory to really kind of make you understand this. Grew up in a trailer, dreamed, would sketch daily of having the dream house. You know, the blueprint who dreamed of being a real house is an entry in dirt. And I now have that house. But Justin and I bought in 2009, bottom of the market, and spent six months even making it habitable. It was in mm-hmm. foreclosure. There was a flood. There was mold. There was mildew. It was like a teardown situation. But it's this beautiful 100-year-old house that we were able to salvage. And 13 years in, it's really good now. And so now we get the situation where when people come here, they only see the finished product. Yeah. They do not see the journey. They do not see what it took to get here. And there's this like certain element of like, well, of course your house is pretty for the holidays or whatever. And I'm like, you do not know what this means to me That's and right. what it took to get here. So I think just leaning into that curiosity, when you're, whenever you feel yourself tempted to compare or, you know, wish what someone else had, ask yourself, what does it mean to them? And what did it I take love to that. get there? Yeah. I love that. And that's that's the truth. Like, that's what I mean by with my, some of my friends. It's like, and I go in and I'm like, you know, like you, I would just delight with you knowing what it means. Yeah. You know, every home has a journey. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that. That's a great caveat. I also really appreciate what you were saying about social media, because I do think so, it might be fair to say that social media is the sort of pinnacle of managing perceptions. It has been. It's yeah. all about image management, right? Yeah. And e- even to the point where, you know, if you, you can try to be vulnerable because that's what you're supposed to do, even though that's not re- really authentic. Right. You know, it's it really is that sort of next level I love where you say, before I add yet another check mark to an already stuffed list, I ask myself, am I doing it for me or am I doing it for them? Yeah. Right? So that's right there, whether it's the house, whether it's social media, whether it's achievement, whether it's, you know, how you're showing up in a social gathering. Am I doing it for me? Mm -hmm. Meaning, is this actually what feels aligned with who I am, with who God made me to be, or am I doing it for them? Right. Yeah. You're not talking about service there. You're talking about managing perceptions. You're yeah. saying, am I doing this to get them to think of me in a certain way? Yes. Or am I doing this because I want to do this? Right. And then you say, am I doing it because I feel like it fulfills a purpose mm-hmm. and a calling over my life? So then we move into purpose. Yeah. Okay. Am I doing this because there's a greater purpose? Am I doing it because I feel like God is asking me to, and I want to be obedient? You sort of touch on all the things, right? So mm-hmm. we first have to sort out, and I just think this is a great list. I'm going to put it in the show notes and it's in the page number from Slow Growth, but these are just great questions. Am I doing it for me? Like this, this align or am I doing it to try to win somebody's approval? Well, if I'm doing it, that, you know, full stop. Okay, then does it fulfill a purpose? Is it something God is asking me to do? Is it aligned with a calling mm. that I have? Or do I want to be obedient? And then the flip side, the other column goes back to, am I doing it in the hopes that it will finally make me enough of something to sit at that same table where no one could be bothered to scoot down and make room for me in the first place. Yeah. Bam, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think we all have those people. I am keenly aware, and I bet you are too, Mary, of the people that still, and no matter how much I rationalize myself out, I still want their approval. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a part in Slow Growth where I talk about an actual dream that I had. Not like a, it wasn't like a <laughs> artistic license metaphor for the book. No, this was an actual stress dream I had where I am in a crowd and I'm chasing, like I'm moving through the sea of people to try to get to an author that I looked up to because in the dream, I had the belief that if I could just put dirt in her hands and she could just read it and see how good it was, then she would tap me on the forehead and I would belong in this author world. And, you know, through the whole dream, I'm just like perpetually like pushing and pushing and I can never quite reach her. And when I, and I sat straight up in bed for real at like three in the morning that night. And when I'm writing about it, the sort of like, you know, hit you in the face, punch you in the gut realization was in all of that time pushing through the crowd, chasing her, did I ever once look back to see any of them? You know, Mm. they were just an obstacle between me and the person I was so desperately Mm. wanting to be seen by. And the realization I had is we're all so busy trying to be seen that we forget to see other people. And I wrote a, a Instagram post about this that said, look both ways. Mm. The people you're looking at wishing they would look back and see you 
if you could pause for a second to look the other direction, there's somebody right now who would give anything if you would see them. Mm. And and I've actually, this has been my little social experiment. You can follow this all the way up the chain. The person you're looking at has somebody they're looking at. They wish that, oh, they would give them the time of day and they have somebody and they have somebody. And I think it, my theory is it goes all the way up to like Oprah. <laughs> I don't know if Oprah has anybody, but I mean, you can just literally chase it all the way up. And that's the other thing I really want to say in this episode is that desire to be seen and to be known and to be loved is not wrong. Mm -hmm. We have that in us because there's a part of us that knows how it should have been, Mm -hmm. that knows like the ultimate experience of humankind was always to be seen, fully known and seen and loved and in close communion and community with God. And so we live in the separation. We live in this fallen world. And so that ache is there for a reason. Yep. And, you know, I I just think there's a line in Slow Growth, another one of my favorites, it says, this truth is sort of dawning on us with each new day, to be seen is to be known, and to be known is to be loved. And with raspy, bated breath, we pull at these strings that are unraveling, they love me, they love me not. Mm. Right? And we're just like, this daisy chain is unraveling in front of us. And so we spend our lives going, they love me, they love me not, they love... And all along, they were never going to be the ones. Similar to the gold stars, we're never going to be enough more to make us stop feeling less than. Other people are never going to be the ones to make us feel fully known. It's so good. It's just so good. That is, again, another permutation of this. If we're managing perceptions, I love that metaphor of the day, you know, it loves me, it loves me not. And I I so, I love what you just, I love the vulnerability of that dream that you shared. Mm. This person will finally give me that. Oh. And I love also that we all have the ver- some version of that, yeah. whatever that may be. Only to find out again and again and again that really, and again, it is that deepest, innermost, most tenderest part of us that does need to be seen and belong ultimately with God, ultimately with ourselves. Ultimately, we get that a little bit from our safe people in life. Mm -hmm. But the more and more I've done the work inside of me, that young girl that just, you know, the more I teach her and show her that what she really wants is my undivided attention with God, her father's undivided attention and just delighting in her, mm-hmm. the less she pulls me, yeah. you know, the more she's cared for, yeah. the more I am free to enjoy and be excited when someone, you know, might, but it does not, I'm not putting a false hope on that. Because I do think there's excitement when someone we've admired, you know, sure, you know, but it's not like I, like that dream just so gets at that deepest longing of that, that little one that really just needs the true nourishment. Yeah. The true love, the true being seen, right? Mm -hmm. From the womb, (laughs) you know, it's so primal again, that no human being is ever going to completely take that all away, Mm -hmm. but we can't care for her. We can't care for her inside of us. Yeah, what you're describing reminds me of a part in Slow Growth. So I think that we talked about this in part one of the episode, but just really quickly in Slow Growth, I introduced these five different versions of the, we moved from most put together woman in the room to the woman always performing because we can all resonate with that. And when I talk about the tightrope walker, I say, I have always wanted to be unshakable, the unsinkable Molly Brown, this, this version of a person who, you know, no matter what happens, when the, when the hard things of life come, they are not rocked. And equally, when the good things come, exactly. it does not change them. You know, they're just sort of, they are who they are. And it says me, on the other hand, I have always been defined by the latest good or bad thing that has happened to me, this up yeah. and down of highlight reels. And it's much more articulate than that in the book, but that's the general idea yeah. is I've always wanted to be unshakable. And instead it's like, I am only as high or as low as what good thing has happened that day. Yeah. Yeah. That's great awareness, but I love the image because I agree. I think that's what we want there is that, yeah, that that was a bummer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was a bummer. And also, I'm okay. That was really fun and exciting. And also, I'm still just me. That's and right. at the end of the day, this to bring this full circle, it gets back to if all this gets taken away, I'm okay. I'm yeah. not, you know, I'm not nothing. You know, that's what we're going for. I, when all this gets taken away, whatever it is, the achieving, the producing, it's like, I'm just, I'm good. I'm good with mm-hmm. myself. 
And again, it's not a spiritual bypassing. It's not, you know, we talk a lot about, there is, I do believe that is the work of spiritual growth, which is why I love this slow growth equals strong roots. It is the fruit of deeply planting those roots in the vine, you know, internally and with the, you know, with the spirit who lives within us, you know, that is the fruit of that, but it is work. It's not magic. It doesn't just happen of I'm okay. I'm okay mm-hmm. in the good and in the bad. I love that. I want to ask you, you ask a question. So I kind of want to turn it back on you as we close. If tomorrow it was all gone, what would you do differently? Mm-hmm. I think that's such a great question that you yeah. ask. If you're game, I'd be curious to see how you would answer it. Yeah. So the rest of that question that I think is also good for people to think about, it's like, what would you roll up your sleeves to do the hard work of rebuilding? And what doesn't really seem to matter that much anymore? And so my answer would be, I would absolutely get this house again. I would absolutely go through all 13 years that it's taken. And it's not done yet, let us be clear. But this this home that we've built the really cool backstory is that I grew up in a trailer that reeked of mildew, felt like it was a stain on my life. And the reason, because God has a sense of humor, we were able to get this house is because it reeked of mildew. (laughs) So it stands for a lot of things in my life. And also just what it has taught me about when things are built with character and integrity. One of the reasons this house was able to stay standing is that the materials they used back then to build in 1880 and 1920 were really solid wood 12 by 12 beams, not any kind of composite board, which meant the mold didn't get into the substance of the wood. The bad stuff didn't really get in because of the character with which we were raised. And so I would absolutely do that work again. I would absolutely build businesses. I would absolutely do those with Justin. I would absolutely do the incredibly hard, vulnerable, naked, open yourself up to criticism work of putting books out into the world, even when it is slow and hard. I would let go of any dollar or time or you know second I spent that was really driven by impressing people. Because anytime we've gone wrong in our lives, it's by investing time or money in things just to impress people. That's so good, Mary. I yeah. second all of that. That's just beautiful. I mean, I that's it right there, right? Mm-hmm. What was true, what was good, what was beautiful. And you know it. I mean, you know, I just want to kind of close asking people today. I'm going to put a lot of these questions in the show notes go get Mary's book, Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots, because there's just so much in it. But I love that question of what would you do differently? And then say that last question again. If tomorrow it was all gone and you had to start over, what would you do differently? What would you roll up your sleeves and do the hard work to rebuild again? And what just doesn't really seem to matter anymore? That's right. What would you do the hard work of doing again? Because it was hard, but it was worth Mm -hmm. it every step of the way, even though it was hard. And what would you not do? What would you let fall away? I think that's a great question that just sort of gets at how am I living authentically? How am I showing up in my real life and what does not matter and what is only about trying to win approval that is cotton candy is marshmallows. It doesn't, (laughs) does not satisfy at all. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to ask you this question. You've sort of answered it, but I'll give you one more chance. What is bringing out the best of you right now? Mm. You know, honestly, I think what's bringing out the best of me are those small commitments. Honestly, I am not, you know, blowing smoker or just saying, you know, the thing because I'm on the show, like truly daily, I am saying, what does it look like to use this season to build character? What does it look like to grow slow? And kind of this is one of those like hidden away kind of seasons for me in between books where I feel like I'm being prepared for something and the pre- preparation work is not easy, you know, that like dealing with my junk, dealing with like the stuff that is for impressing or whatever. And like, what does it truly look like for me to become a really good steward of all of this and to trust myself with this so that I do feel capable of handling more? Because I do feel like I've been in that loop of, no, 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 no. I don't really think I could do, I don't think I could handle this much more. So I just go back to the beginning. So I'm doing that work to build Mm. self-trust in the shortest version, self-trust through being a good steward. Yeah. And it's not comfortable work, but it is such good work. Like, you know, talking about unraveling in your forties and all that, like I picture myself like the very malleable clay, Mm. you know, good in a good way. Time has not dried out that clay. In fact, it's leaning into being just wide open to the, you know, the potter to work the clay into something useful. And I talk about in slow growth, he is making me into a vessel that can be filled up over and over again and can be poured out for others mm. instead of just some monument to myself. Well, I just want you to know, I see the fruit of it 
in your life. I see it online. I see the fruit of it. I, it's just funny. You start, I'm like, oh, there's Mary. There's yeah. Mary. You know what I mean? And it's beautiful. Yeah. Keep doing the work because we need you. We mm. need your voice. I think we are hungry, you know, culturally for people who are doing that work. Yeah. So thank you for doing that work, Mary. Thank you for being someone who is so consistently doing that work and leading us. Tell people where to find you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the best way, honestly, the best thing to probably do out of this conversation, we talked about this in part one too, but we really started to talk about some of these characters. We have the masquerader, the tightrope walker, the performer, like a ballerina on her toes, the illusionist in the distance and the contortionist. We have a quiz. It's like a 60 second minute or two tops quiz you can take. And it will tell you not only which of the types of the woman always performing you are, but the places that are your strengths, the places you get stuck and how to move forward with that purpose towards what you're being called to do, that place of service to others. So I would take the quiz. You can find that at marymorans.com slash quiz or achieverquiz.com. They'll both go to the same place. And then you'll sort of be in the hub of marymorans.com and you can find the show, the podcast. You can listen to Allison's episode on the Mary Morant show, you know, all the different things there. And it's at Mary Morant's on Instagram. That's pretty much Mm, I think that's really the only social media place I hang out these days. So you can send me a DM if you liked this episode. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. We love you here. And hopefully we'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing what's next. You've got a lot of great things in store. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Best of You. Be sure to check out the show notes for any resources and links mentioned in the show. You can find those on my website at drallisoncook.com. That's Allison with one L, cook.com. Before you forget, I hope you'll follow the show now so that you don't miss an episode. And I'd love it if you'd go ahead and leave a review. It helps so much to get the word out. I look forward to seeing you back here next Thursday. And remember, as you become the best of who you are, You honor God, you heal others, and you stay true to your God-given self.